thanks everybody um, for uh, for attending. Um, I'm going to be talking today about um, about Data Explorer, and like everything, uh, Microsoft's naming convention with new products is on moving targets. Uh, so so when I announced this, um, they they were branded as Custo pools, but now they've been rebranded as Data Explorer pools. Um, I quite quite like the sound of Custo, and as we um, as we go through my presentation. And we'll be looking at some Custo query language, and uh, hopefully some of what I say will resonate with you. Um, this very, very much is an intro to how to use what was Azure Data Explorer, what has now been um, pretty much wholly integrated into Preview, into Synapse. Um, we'll talk through some of the features and other bits and pieces. So uh, we'll look at how this fits into the Synapse stack overall. Okay, so a little bit about me. Um, I am, uh, my name is Richard Conway. I'm uh, founder and director of a company called ElastiCloud. Um, and I am, uh, I guess you could call me a retired Azure MVP and uh, Microsoft regional director. Um, <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm a strong voice of the community, even though it's been quite a slow year post pandemic for me, but um, uh, I've been running the Azure user group uh, in the UK for, around about 11 years now so uh it was a good community like all of us a little bit bit exhausted through the pandemic but now we're picking up again so uh if you find yourself in london and uh close to um uh either the bell pub in middlesex street or the reactor uh please come in and join us we run monthly meetings um i've been working with big data tooling <clears throat> since around about 2013 uh, when I first got interested in Spark and started contributing to some of the early versions, uh, 0.3 and 0.4, um, specifically around the security manager. Um, and that's really what I've been doing through my career. As soon as I discovered Hadoop and I got involved in the Hadoop on Azure tab, I totally committed myself to data. But, you know, I'm a much more of an application developer. I come come from much more of an HPC and an integration background. So uh, the new world of big data really did resonate with me. So um, over the past eight, nine years or so, I've made quite a lot of contributions to, to these projects uh, to understand them a lot more. Okay, so um, I wanna start by talking about big data in Azure and just uh, not teaching anybody to suck eggs, but really to just hone in on some of the core concepts um, that are the modern data platform. Um, and what I'm going to start with is I am going to start with this image and some of you, some of you may actually recognize this. I, I hope that a lot of you do. Um, and this was what Microsoft called the, the modern data warehouse, the modern cloud data warehouse. Um, and it really exemplifies some of the modern concepts of big data, such as, um, Lambda and Kappa architectures. And for those that don't know, um, Lambda architecture is a very, very common way of describing how we can take a batch layer, a streaming layer, and a serving layer, and put them into one architecture. So what we're really talking about is the holy, the holy grail, um, at least for most of us, is an integrated solution which allows us to perform these Lambda architectures where at any point in time we can query, um, we can query the state of a data source which is being continually updated um, via batch or streaming. Um, so the, the common, common platform for reporting kind of looked like this right at the start. Um, this goes back as far as 2016 and it's had loads of different variations but um, we will take in uh, structured, unstructured, semi-structured data and use Azure Data Factory, which, um, which is Microsoft's cloud orchestrator. We would land this data into an Azure Data Lake store. Um, we might process this data using Azure Databricks, and before that it was Azure HD Insight. And then we would model this data in um, Synapse, uh, SQL pools now, um, and then we would create some some kind of analytical KPIs. We might do some Web 2.0 um, with Cosmos DB and NoSQL as well. So this is a very, very common pattern that 
people have been using for a long time for both reporting and you can see that other path there into uh, into no into a NoSQL application. Um, so Microsoft has come along and tried to consolidate a lot of this. And um, for for some of us who've been in Azure long enough, we've we've really we've really seen these services grow. Some services haven't grown. Um, for example, Stream Analytics every single year. It's a beautiful service. It's one of my favorite platform services. Um, it's just beginning to get a little bit more investment, but it it remains stagnant for a while. But it really is the pinnacle of the streaming part of what we what we define as our Lambda architecture, how we get streamed information from an event hub or an IoT hub, how we can query that information through uh, batch windows or tum tumbling windows, hopping windows, they're called sliding windows, different types of windowing function, um, or just a or just a straight pass through, and then consume this through um, all of the different uh, uh, syncs that you can see on the left, whether or not we consume through logic apps or function apps or Power BI. Um, now you can see that that old architecture, that modern cloud data warehouse that's been around for a long time, um, the Databricks portion replaced by Synapse in Microsoft's modern architecture. But you can see that there's a there's a there's a loose coupling here between different parts of Synapse. So You've probably heard some quite a few things today about Synapse pipelines, or you will hear um, SQL Serverless, which is a, a great tool which allows us to write SQL queries onto an Azure data lake. And now Spark pools, where we can define and create notebooks. And with these notebooks, we can query data lakes, we can run, you know, some fairly, fairly complex data frame operations um, on some of the data in our lake. And Lots of other sources, and then finally, we um, we uh, we present that data back. So we've got a presentation layer where we, where we might apply machine learning, some kind of predictive analytics, or we might model that data um, so that Power BI can read this. So this is where the architecture that we showed formerly has morphed, and you can see that there are a lot of synapse boxes, um, but. One of the boxes that isn't present is um, Data Explorer pools or Custo pools. Um, Data Explorer is not a new service. Um, in its preview, it was about six years old, um, but many people have been using it um, on some incredibly highly demanding workloads for years. And it sort of goes something like this. It go it when we talk about Data Explorer. We can talk about a platform service that literally embodies that concept of Lambda architecture, because whilst we can whilst we can ingest data um, and we can create pipelines using the new Synapse pipelines and put data into Data Explorer um, through batch processes, um, Azure Data Explorer also allows you to um, to receive directly. Um, event hub messages and what this means is that you can you can take event hub data and you can feed it straight into data explorer while you're doing these batch loads and at the same time anybody can query this as well so this is this is a strong embodiment of that idea of lambda architecture where if we remove everything else um, data explorer actually gives us the the batch the streaming and the serving layers. And there we go, there's some of the inputs. So, <clears throat> so, so we saw the stack, but let's let's look at an alternative stack with Data Explorer pools. Um, we've got the ability to ingest now through Synapse pipelines, which is um, uh, effectively a, a, a more tightly coupled upgrade to ADF which um, gives us features which allow us to link to other parts of Synapse, other data stores and compute. Um, that same pattern would allow us to ingest through that. It would allow us to store through that um, within our data lake. Um, and then our Data Explorer pool would allow us to 
um, ingest that data. We would have um, fairly, fairly complex analytics that we could write using the Custo query language. And then we can serve that back um, in an analytical model, star schema, facts and dimensions in um, within a SQL pool and consume that through Power BI. So that's, that's another representation of that. And one of the things that you'll find, um, and this is predominantly the way that Microsoft do things with every single data platform service, um, there are lots of different ways to ingest this data. And Microsoft have made it easy through this idea of um, one click integration with data. So the idea that you can you can go through a GUI, you can run through a wizard, you can ingest a data source from a file or from um, a location on storage, and your uh, your data will be populated in a table. Um, similarly, there's very, very tight integration with Synapse pipelines and the ability to take those pipelines and um, and then read and write to Data Explorer as if it was, you know, as if the two things were just the same mechanism. Um, you'll see, and if you've looked at Synapse pipelines, you'll understand that it becomes very, very easy to um, to invoke a Synapse notebook for a Spark pool, um, a stored procedure, um, and whilst that close integration between Data Explorer pools. Um, is not quite there yet within Synapse pipelines. You can have a few workarounds and you can manually um, give it the endpoint of the pool and set it up as a linked service. Um, so there's there's common patterns that you can use already, even though it's in preview. Um, there's the ability for Spark notebooks to talk to Data Explorer and, and vice versa. Uh, Microsoft have created this fantastic command line tool called Light Ingest, which is a parallel running tool, just like um, uh, just like some of the storage command line interfaces, where it will, in a multi-threaded way, it will read all of your data and it will write all of that data as quickly as possible um, to Data Explorer pools. And then you've got an SDK which will do the same thing. So um, you can write code in C Sharp or Python and read and write data from Data Explorer. And so, um, I've worked with Data Explorer a lot, and um, I'm going to show quite a few demos afterwards just to give you an idea of what this integration and tight coupling actually looks like. But um, when we talk about, when we talk, when I say that this is the embodiment of Lambda architecture, well, let's let's make some assumptions. You have a you have a data lake that um, that Data Explorer um, has access to. Um, through a managed identity, it maybe has a storage blob reader um, role. And imagine that you are storing lots of different logs on this uh, on this lake, and you might be writing files every minute, every 10 minutes, every five minutes, it doesn't matter. Um, what will happen is you, Data Explorer will allow you to create an ingestion path and you might recognize some of the symbols on here, but for those that don't, um, what we have is we have the event grid and we have an event grid topic and subscription. And the way the event grid works is every single time a file is written to our lake, it will send out an alert. It will alert something and say, anybody who's interested, this file has landed. So. Whenever we want to create a real-time ingestion, and we don't want to rely on that batch need, uh, that batch capability of running something on a regular schedule, but we just want to load our data when it lands, uh, we can very, very simply through a few point and clicks, create a, a connection to a folder, container on the lake to a folder path, and automatically an event grid topic will be created in the background and every single time something is written um, our data explorer will get alerted and what that means for us is that data explorer will have everything it needs to go and get that file 
and all of this happens within fractions of a second. So you can continually write data to that lake and Data Explorer can continually read it. So it's a it's a different way of thinking about load and ingestion. Uh, and similarly enough, we don't necessarily need to physically write files. Um, the same sort of connectivity through log logs is supported through streaming. So for example, if you were, and one pattern that I've commonly used, if you were writing to log analytics and you're, you wanted to extract your logging data through a stream, one of the things that you could do is you could create an export policy and that export policy would la allow you to read row by row everything that is being written to log analytics in real time and it would be put onto the event hub. Now, Data Explorer can treat that event hub as a connection and it will start appending all of that data as it lands to, um, to its tables. So, so one of the things which um, <clears throat> is a really, really powerful thing, and I've used the, uh, just to, to give you um, an understanding of some of the acronyms, um, we've got a whole bunch of logs, which are security logs, which are quite voluminous on the left. And on the right, we have um, security operation center analysts who are continually reading because they need to know what's happening. Um, within the organization. And the data in this case is getting into Data Explorer or our Data Explorer pools now, which are part of Synapse. And we've got this, we've got this process of landing the data. And many of you will be familiar with that data lake life life cycle of landing, staging, or curated, or now more familiar terms with this are bronze silver and gold where we go through stages of landing very raw data which might be sparse it might not be uh, in an unfriendly in, in a friendly readable state we stage that data so it's a little bit easier to read and then we might curate the output so if a SOC analyst wanted to read that stage data we would have to do something to it now that's that's a very common operation with spark Normally, what you would have is uh, you would have um, uh, you would maybe use Databricks and Databricks Delta, um, or now Spark uh, Spark pools and open source Delta to to keep um, updating uh, Delta tables and then allow the analyst to read from those tables. Now, in order to do that, you'd have to run Spark notebooks, um, which much harder to to do in real time with structured streaming and those um, those pass through windows. Um, it, it's a lot more of an advanced feature for Spark and generally most people use it in more of a batch batch way. So one of the amazing features that um, that Data Explorer pools has is this idea of an update function and it's almost as if you can take any data that lands through a pipeline by saying, I want this function to execute the table that this lands on, whether it lands in, a whether you're, or not you're taking a file from the lake or an event hub message, um, the function will be applied. It will read that source row that's just landed and it will do a transformation using the update function or an update policy as it's called. And it will stage this so that it might um, it might type check. It might do a bunch of stuff to project back out only the things that are interesting in this case for the SOC analyst so that there's not too much data, um, but it's staged in a nice way. So when you think about it, um, Data Explorer also contains that ability to orchestrate within itself um, with a lot of functions um, to programmatically control how it transforms that data from one table to another, just like in SQL where you would call a stored procedure. Um, now you can see here that we've got, this is where it will slightly differ from SQL. You can see that we've got two red arrows and 
The two red arrows on the right are to denote horizontal scale out. And that's incredibly important here because the, the core difference is whenever you have SQL, you have an SLA. You know, in between, there's some fantastic work that Microsoft have done with the Polaris engine and to be able to build a DAG within SQL to make it a little closer to horizontal scale out, but it's still SQL. Um, Data Explorer, actually, you have contact with the underlying nodes, right? You don't you don't have an um, an SLA with a metric um, as in you know CD woos or DTUs. Um, you have a number of nodes and you have capabilities of the overall cluster, so you can physically see the virtual machines, and it's very very easy to scale these out to hundreds of virtual machines. And what they'll do is they'll allow you to. They'll give you more slots to ingest data. They'll give you more uh, connectivity based on the number of nodes that you have so that more people can, can read as well. So you have this very, very strong concept, an unbiased concept of many readers and many writers with Data Explorer. And one of the things that you'll find, you, you have these update policies that we've talked about, but you can also have extents policies and extents allow you to um, separate your data and really localize it so that it is um, it is in one place or another, not in, not all over the place. Okay, and before we dive into demos, I'm just going to go through a couple of features um, that I'll bring through in the demos, hopefully, um, which is where the idea of Custo pools or now Data Explorer pools becomes a very, very powerful thing. So if you think about Synapse holistically, um, the idea of SQL pools makes sense to a lot of people because um, it's taking um, a very, very powerful tool, very powerful framework of a data warehouse, which people have been using for decades, and it's placing it into a context where you have a dedicated capability or a serverless capability. And so you can very, very easily read files from the lake, or you can have um, a structured, normalized um, database or an analytical model. But one of the things that you'll find is that Spark can very easily talk to SQL. So with the Spark SQL Analytics provider, you can connect to a SQL table and you can read data for that table and present it into in a data frame. But you can also write back using the same SQL analytics provider or JDBC. You can also write back data to that table in the SQL pool. Um, now, interestingly, um, Microsoft has got the same functionality for um, the same functionality for Custo pools or Data Explorer pools, in that it allows Spark. It's built. Microsoft has built a provider which allows you to append data to a custo table and also read and retrieve that data back from that table. So um, what is very, very interesting is that Spark pools are a nice bridge between these two storage and compute frameworks because you can't actually store anything permanently. It's not a persistent store, Spark. Um, you you need to you can store in Delta or you can store on the on the lake in Parquet, but you have to physically read those. They're disconnected from Spark. Um, while you're running a Spark job, you can uh, you, you Spark has a cache, which was its real power over Hadoop, in that you could load data into memory. Um, but these only have the lifetime as a, of a job. So one of the things that Data Explorer or Custo pools gives us is the ability to have something that parallels to SQL, which might be better for certain types of um, use cases than SQL. And Spark um, and Spark notebooks offer a, a really, really good command and control between both of those. Um, so um, this is a this is a demo that I've run in the past, um, and it follows a very, very familiar format of being able to create tables, create table mappings, create an ingestion. Um, and 
you know, have the ability to join sets of tables together um, and then run update functions so that you can coalesce two, two tables as they land. Um, and this is where, again, that there's that incredible power of um, Data Explorer being its own orchestrator, which we're going to look at. Um, one of the things that I'm also going to touch on as well, and I um, and I've written a lot about this on my blog, so I'll leave this. Uh, I'll leave my blog with you so that you can look back at all of my examples uh, here. But one of the things that you'll find as well is that there are so many different functions um, within Custo pools. Um, you can see here that this is the Custo query language, which is now um, it's now the de facto standard for being able to query Azure. Um, you use it for Azure Monitor under the seams. It uses it's it's used for building Azure dashboards. Um, it's used for log analytics, so it's an incredible support tool and support language. And it's used for Data Explorer, where you can do a lot of really really advanced um, queries um, using this kind of syntax here. Um, and in this case, um, just because I had a, I was going to go through, so I was cherry picking features um, that I thought were interesting. Um, you can create functions and you can tie them to tables, and you know, in a similar way as you can do with SQL, you can use roles to apply row level security like this. Um, and I'm going to start by showing you um, some demos now, but just as a takeaway, everything you see here, you can see on my blog. Um, through Custo Lightning Facts um, at AIZoo.info. All of the examples related to Azure Data Explorer, um, but you can do everything that you read there within um, Custo Pools. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over and we're going to see some of the amazing things that you can do. OK, so here's my resource group. Uh, which is called Data Toboggan. Um, I did. I was. I wasn't quick enough, obviously, because I couldn't get a uh, uh, Data Toboggan uh, Synapse workspace. I was going to squat on it. Um, but what I've done here is I've um, I've created a link storage account, and if we just take a look through the containers, um, this is the default container that's created, and I've created one called Landing, and um, in my examples, I've generated some credit card data um, to show you how row level security works. And I've also, because I want to show you something about Custo query language, I've got a sales data set as well, which we're going to be taking a look at. So let's, let's go back through the breadcrumbs and you can see that I've got one active Spark pool here and I've got a Data Explorer pool present here. Um, I can scale up, I can scale down. Um, I have got a query interface here. So one of the things that you'll find is that I've created a database already called Sales1 and I can get an extended web UI. Um, this. It's quite a large table, but this is going to be our sales table and it can respond to queries here. We've also got um, dashboards in this case, um, so I can write queries and create my own operational dashboards. Um, this table is quite large. I think there's about a million and a half rows in this. So I'm going to cancel this for now. Um, and also we've got the ability to ingest data through here, which I'm just going to show you. Oops, let's get rid of this. Right, so um, here we go. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna show you a couple of ways to do things. So um, I've already got this this sales table. In fact, you know what? I might do things a little bit differently. And we've got a database called Sales One, but what I'm going to do is I am going to go to databases here and 
I'm going to create a new database. I'm going to call this, unsurprisingly, sales two. And you can see that um, I've got a retention period, and that is how long um, data is retained for on a sliding window. And I've got a very, very strong cache, so I can cache queries and cache data, which makes the execution of common queries much faster. Um, so the cache expires. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to, okay, so we've created that database. Let's just refresh. Um, we've got sales two, and I am going to refresh this now. I should have sales two. Fantastic. So you can see here the first thing that I'm going to do is I've got I've got all of my sales in a zipped CSV, and I'm going to use create a table. To do this, you can see that we can define real numbers and longs and date times and um, and whenever I do any control statements, I prefix it with a dot. So it's the first time we're creating it, I am going to run that. And there we go. We've got a sales table. And if I want to check. Right, there's nothing in it at the moment, which is what I would expect. So in order to be able to do anything with this table, we also need to create a mapping. So let's just change the database again. Now what a mapping does is it maps the source file to um, to the table. OK, so. Here and I'm going to run that and you can see that the definition is fairly simple here. Um, once you get used to it, it's just the name, it's the data type, um, which by default is a string here and it's the position and whether or not there's a constant value or not. OK, so and I think I did that on. Nope, I inadvertently did that on sales one. I need to do that on sales two. It's fine. Let's, let's run that. And there we go. OK, so we've got our sales mapping. Um, now what I'm going to do is go back to here. And if I click on this and right click, I can go to ingest data and it picks out the database. I'm going to choose existing table and I can choose sales and click on source to go next. And this is where I'm going to upload um, a file. Uh, here's one I made earlier. And it's a zipped file of. Might take a few moments. OK, while well, that is uploading and that ingestion is happening, um, just for the sake of not wasting time, oops, I'm going to go back here and I'm going to take you through a few commands. We'll look at the first sales table. So there's a couple of really simple commands in Custo. Um, there's take the first 200 rows of our sales. So you can see here we end up with 200 rows. Um, other expressions I can try here are limit. So I can limit the number of rows that come back. And let's just choose something so we can fit it on a screen. And if I just choose limit 10, you can see I'll just get the first 10 rows as they're presented back. Um, similarly, I've got count. So I can just run that. And you can see it tells me that I've got a million rows. That's probably because I ingested that twice. And OK, now we're going through the motions. It's automatically picked up the fact that this is a zip. But this is a CSV. Um, I gave it a mapping, so you can see I I typed everything date times or longs, and it's it's mapped that. Um, I'm going to use an existing sales mapping I created my own, and it's mapped it using my sales mapping. Okay, so it could have predicted everything. It could have created the table. It could have done a whole load of things through sampling, like um, when we were in first schema in Spark. Um, I didn't let it because I wanted to show you the extended commands. Right, so while that is 
ingesting into sales table. Um, we've taken a look at how to count. Let's take a look at some, some more advanced things. Um, if we looked at our sales, it gave us revenues, order dates. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a look at a function which is very similar to group by called summarize. And that allows us to create additional columns. And in this case, I'm creating a column called earnings, which is split by region and split by year, which is grouped by region and grouped by year. Sorry. And what you'll find is that I can apply a function here. So I'm rounding this, I'm summing all of the total revenue and I'm turning it into billions and then I'm reordering this. So if I, if I look at this, what it gives me is it gives me a list of earnings for each region um, for every single year in billions. Not, not a very complex query for what it's doing and very, very similar to the way that you would use group by um, and having in SQL. And so one of the things where Synapse gets powerful is that it brings parity between a lot of the visualizations. And so in SQL, you can flip between a table view and you can flip between a um, you can flip between a table view and you can flip between a chart view. Um, this is one of the things that, um, and actually now let's flip to sales too because I think that, okay, yeah, so that data has been ingested. So we've got our sales table and if we, if we run this query, what this will do is it will project our um, regions, total revenues, it will do the summarization but then we'll use a render command at the end. And the render command is very, very powerful in that it gives us a, a set of charts. And it automatically, the difference between this and Data Explorer is that it was very, very custom in Data Explorer. So I can run um, the same query here on the web UI or something else called Custo Explorer. Um, but if I take this query here and and run this render command, you can see that it renders it renders based on the environment that it's in. And so there are a few different environments where you can run these queries, but in Synapse, um, it gives you the the nice um, uh, configuration box here, which is common to everything. OK, so it gives your renders all, all kinds of parity. Um, now, again, another powerful thing with uh, Data Explorer, Data Explorer pools, is the ability to create functions, very much like um, SQL or table value functions. Um, and we can run this simple create function if not exists. And you can see here that I've got a query which does what we've done before, which is to order um, this group by. Um, so I count, I create a profit field, I create an earnings field, and um, I create an earnings ratio, which is the difference between profit and earnings. So as a percentage, so if I ran that here, you can see that um, this is by country. So we've got our earnings transactions, and then we've got the earnings ratio, and if I run that function here, um, I can I can basically treat that function as a table. So you can see I've done a different um, order by here so that I get earnings ratio from the top. OK. Um, now we've we've done some we've done some ingestion this way and you've seen let's pull that into um, into uh, data explorer pools but one another way another way of doing this is it's very very easy to build pipelines now unfortunately it's not tightly integrated yet with synapse um, so you still have to use the old data explorer tools and activities but eventually what we would expect is custo pools to have its own synapse integration here which will make it really powerful. But if we look at this copy activity, um, what we've done is what I've done rather is I've taken a, um, a the, our sales data set, which is on storage, and I've set up a sync. So this 
Azure Data Explorer Table 1. Um, we've got the database, we've got sales, and I've given this the mapping. Okay, but what I might do now is just change one of those. Um, in fact, in fact, if I edit this, um, should just be able to change this to the database. Okay, so we've now got sales two, and if we go back to our pipeline, um, <coughs> database has changed. So we've got our mapping, we've got our table, and let's just run this in debug and touch wood. When this starts, we should also be able to pull data into that. Let's keep a bit of a watchful eye. I think it might take a minute or two to do, but let's keep that running um, whilst we do some other stuff. Got a few minutes left, I think. So, um, Okay, let's click on our Synapse Analytics. And we'll just run through a few more of the queries. Let's go to our Develop Hub. And I think we got as far as this. Um, there's a lot of command and control capability, and we can basically show who has access to things. We can show the number of databases, we can show capacities on each database, and we can show caches here. Um, now, really one powerful thing, and we'll whiz through this in the last couple of minutes, but the ability to be able to create time series like this is a really strong feature. And you can see here that we use the make series function and we use a time chart. And in this example, I've limited this with um, with fewer data points, um, which we can scroll over on the time charts. And because because this is really about append, um, one of the things that we can do is we can take these series and um, we can create we can create very very arema like constructs. So you can see that I've got a moving average here, which takes the noise out of the series. Um, and I have some very, very strong functions like series first. So if we were to run this, you can see here that just in a very, very simple manner, we've been able to take moving averages, we'd be able to take the whole series, and we'll be able to take all of the noise away from this um, by uh, doing things like series subtract, series first functions, um, and really understanding how to relate things back to a time series. Um, I think we're just on time now, um, so I probably don't have time for this. But uh, another incredible feature is the ability to apply all of the kinds of row level security that you would over um, analysis services or SQL um, using these functions. Um, very, very powerful because you can you can just apply programmatic logic and just to show you in this case we have a credit card which i was going to show you some masking on but you know it really sort of brings home the power of taking an identity and then using that identity to to ensure that the user only sees what they're supposed to see um so with that i will draw um, this talk to a close i hope you had a really good introduction to Custo pools there's so much more than i've shown here um, but i think this is going to be one of the three pillars that you're seeing along with SQL and Spark. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me.